I'm going to ask you a question. Sacked in Oklahoma means to get beat up. I don't even know if that's true in West Virginia. Is it true in West Virginia? No. Okay. I thought that might be the case. Everything I think is true, y'all change just slightly. Who told me about brown beans today? They were like, we're going to have brown beans and cornbread. I was like, like frijoles? Like, you know, refried beans? You're special. Tonight we're going to be talking about Joseph. But Joseph is not the center of any of these stories, really. And the thing we, we really want to focus on is Joseph does something that we all do. Somebody wrongs us, and we, we need to repay them a little bit. You know, I'm not saying, you know, if they stab us in the eye, we're going to stab them in the eye. But it's one of those that, you know, you stab me in the eye, I'm going to crush your fingers. You know, I'm going to do a little bit. You know, you wrong me a lot, I'm still going to wrong you a little bit. Before I give you full forgiveness, I'm going to wrong you a little bit. And it's one of those where I want you to think about that one time that I tried to have you sit quietly for a minute, and all of you fell in kindergarten. Um, but it's, just, it's the thought that time is one of those that if you're looking on the outside, or, or you're sitting with a pretty girl, time is very short. But any time you're in the middle of it, or your hand's on a hot stove, it's very quick. And so what we get to is we don't want to consider and we don't want to read through the story so fast that we forget what a year is like. A year is a long time. And we don't want to forget that in the middle of this story, Joseph is getting revenge, you know, a small piece, small piece of revenge on his brothers. But he does this in Genesis 42, starting in verse 1. Now Jacob saw that there was rain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is rain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place, so that we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he disguised himself to them, and he spoke to them harshly, and he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. <clears throat> Apologize again. There's a reason I sound like a guy tonight. Um, I don't like it, don't worry. I like my food and sound in the voice of the Makes me happy, and I don't really care what you think. Um, now, the truth is that in this story, we, we've got a setting where he should have got a little retribution already, right? He's king. Uh, we know that all the land is worried about death, and then, you know, Joseph is great. Everybody's coming to him. And when Joseph's brothers bow down to him, gee, Joseph recognizes them. And, and he's got these brothers who mistreated him coming to him, bowing down. <clears throat> they don't know who he is, but he knows they're bowing down to him. And, and so he's already got some retribution. And most of us, you know, when a, when a brother comes to us, we do expect that minimum. You know, come to me in repentance. You know, and that, that's a biblical standard. Of, you know, I have something against you, go to one another. And if you're repentant, forgive you, embrace you, bring you back as a brother. That's not exactly what the story is going to consist of. Verse 7. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said, Yeah, no, my lord. 
but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man, we are honest men, and your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. His original plan is he's going to put everybody in prison and one of them is going to be released. These, these brothers come to him humbled. I mean, their life is in his hands. They're already getting this whole thought of there's something being repaid to us because of what we've done to Joseph. And, and these thoughts are already, uh, they're, they're already in their heads. And what they're doing is they're coming to Joseph humbled already. And, and Joseph starts with one, calling them spies. Two, he then threatens them and says, you're all going to stay in prison until you get your youngest brother here. But then, three days later, he calms down a little bit. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words may be verified, and you will not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, Truly, we are guilty concerning our brother. Because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy. And you would not listen. Now come the reckoning for this blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood that there was an interpreter between them. He turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bowed him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. So he calmed down. He doesn't, he doesn't now want to imprison his brothers until one of them gets back to the youngest brother. He knows the distance from Egypt to Canaan is a long journey. But he still does something to get back at them. And it, it sounds positive and it's really negative. And what he does is he puts their money back in. So at this point, not only has he considered them spies, but now they're rightfully thieves. They've gained something, and the money has never been turned over. And he does this after hearing them struggling within themselves. Struggling to say, this is our brother's blood coming back from us. He, he understands exactly what they're saying. He doesn't let them know, but he knows exactly what they're saying. And at that point is when he puts the gold back in their sacks to get them a little bit more. Verse 26. So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money. And behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned. And behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your household, and go. 
But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Continues in 35. Now it came about, as they were emptying their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their fathers saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death, if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol and sorrow. The greatest point we can probably get from this is this story of a group of brothers who are repentant. And Joseph has this ingenious idea to get back from his brothers. Just pretend you don't know who they are. First, he calls them out of spies. Second, he makes them thieves. He puts one of them in prison. He puts all of them in prison. But Joseph was the favorite of his father. Joseph was the one who had the coat of many colors because his father picked him his favorite. And yet, who suffered? The father. And the issue that we have is, this is a time before the law. It is. And the advantage of, of the law that, that comes in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is that it limits people. The, the law was never meant to say, the minimum punishment shall be. The law was meant to keep people from getting one step over the other. You know, you know, I, I hit you, so you hit me twice, so I hit you thrice, so I hit you force. I don't know what force is, but you know, it'll work. Somebody hits this. And you, and you have this, you know, building upon building upon building. They've wronged me, I'm going to wrong them more. But then you have this other concept that is not really protected against in the law. It's this, I still got to get back to you a little bit. And from Joseph's perspective, I mean, he has suffered for many years. He's, he's not only been a slave, he's not only been in prison. But his brothers are the ones who did it to him. I mean, he has physical and emotional suffering that he wants to get back out of his brothers. But when his brothers come to him, and one, they're bowing down to him. They're humble. Two, they're specifically mentioning it and saying, did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy. It's his blood that's coming back on us. And, and Joseph is sitting there understanding all of this. And it's too easy for us to put us right back there. Somebody comes to us and they honestly have wronged us deeply. And they come to us and they're repenting. We want to make him squirm just a little bit. We want to get just that little tiny piece back from them. And so when God talks about it, Jesus has a way of saying things in such a way that it's never as nice as the Old Testament. Jesus is kind of like a punch. You know, the Old Testament kind of hands you stuff and gives you stories, you know. Listen to this story, learn from this story. Jesus goes, boom, here it is. And when Jesus talks about it, he says, he gives you a parable. He says, there was a man who owed millions of dollars. And then the king calls to him, and the man begs for mercy, and the king grants him mercy. And then he goes and sees another man, and the man owes him a year's wage. And he imprisons him. And he punishes the other man because he has not paid up what he owes. And in these we have parallel stories, but of course this is a lot 
a nice way to learn it than Jesus coming out and saying to us, Now, when God forgives you for everything, and your brother sins against you, which is the bigger debt? We, we want retribution, but we never want to receive retribution. We don't want God to come to us and be fair. We always say that this is, this is one of those themes we get behind. We say fair. And we've all done it. That's not fair, right? We're like, it's not fair. It's not right. It's not equal. We want equality when it benefits us. We do not want equality when it doesn't benefit us. Because fair works differently when we deal with God. Fair for God is this. You're not perfect. I created you perfect. I'm perfect and only can have what's perfect around me. I'm so perfect that the very presence of wickedness I have to drive out by my glory. That, that's fair. And if fair looks like that, then what fair looks like is this. God says, if you get a little bit of retribution, so do I. And a little bit of retribution for God is too much for us. If he punishes us and says, I'm not going to cover 99% I've taken care of 99% of your problems, but I'm going to get a little bit out of you. I'm going to get just a little high for this one. That's too much. Because the way that God presents it is that if we fail in one area, if we transgress His word once, we transgress His word. And so if we look at each other with this mentality that he has where I've got to get a little bit back. I'm not going to do everything that you did to me, but I'm still going to wrong you a little bit. And we apply it to God and we say, God, that's excellent. You just get a little bit back. But yet when we deal with God, we know that he's so perfect that if he doesn't cleanse 1%, that's too that's too little. 99% is not good enough for us. It won't work because we'll come into the presence of God and we'll say, God, I'm in your presence. And he'll say, you're not perfect. You can't actually be in my presence. The other day we were discussing hell and I, I, I love the concept of hell. I, I think we have a twisted view because if you look at the scriptures on hell, you're going to get different pictures. You will. You'll have one picture and it looks like they're viewing people. They can look on people. And you have one picture where it's complete darkness. And you have another picture where there are worms. And you have another picture where it's flames. And you have another where it's a lake of fire. You have these different images. And the problem is we make them very literal. And we say hell is like a, a lake of fire that no one can see anything except those things which they can see, which you understand this gets confusing at a point. Except those things which they can see, which cause them further to suffer. Okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully that was as clear as mud and we're all walking in the mud. But what we're trying to get to is, if we look at hell and imagine it the way that he talks about heaven, very figurative. You know, it's suffering, it's banishment from God. When you get into the details, it's going to get fuzzy. You don't completely understand it. If we treat hell that way, then what, what we look at is, where does hell come from? We look at hell and we understand that it was not even made for us. But yet God made it for the demons, the angels that had been passed out from his presence. Because they had to have some place to go. And if they're no longer perfect, like we were mentioning, God, one, either causes them to cease to exist, or he's got to create a place for them. And so he does. He creates a place for them. And hell in the Bible is more the intense agony that is worse than fire. The intense agony that is worse than death. That is worse than being warm. That is worse than the worst descriptions we can put in Scripture. That doesn't even fit a lake of fire because it's not bad enough. Having every inch of your body burned with fire is going short. And the Bible is unable to describe things like heaven and hell because they're so extreme. Because even our worst imagination doesn't come close to the reality. And 
And in that, there's this picture of God being good, perfect, holy, and righteous, and nothing associated with Him being bad. And everything apart from Him being wickedness, evil, pain, suffering. All those things that came with sin. And we look at that and we see this God who has to do so much just to allow us back in. Because His presence needs to be perfect. And the second He lets Him filth in, it's not perfect anymore. The second He lets us in with that 1% we haven't forgiven somebody for, that 1% that He hasn't covered, it's too much. And Jesus' words here are some of the harshest words we will ever consider. We don't forgive. He doesn't forgive us. And if we don't forgive 100%, why are we expecting a different from him? Because honestly, this story of Joseph is not one I'd like you to imitate. I don't think any of us should imitate this story. Because it's not the story that Jesus taught. And in this, we have, one, a challenge of forgiveness. That we forgive those so that we may be forgiven. And that if we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. But yet we also have this beautiful picture of a heaven that, that is described in the streets of gold. This is described as brighter than ten suns. This is described as the most beautiful building in the world, so much so that the old Solomon's temple with all its decorations and nothing. This beautiful description of heaven in which he says it's perfect. There's nothing wrong in it. There's nothing bad in it. There's no wickedness. There's no suffering. There is nothing bad in it. I can't even let that kind of stuff in. And his opportunity for us to steal our righteousness from Christ so that we can then come in on Christ's coattails, Christ's righteousness, and we can go to a place that's perfect, that we just don't fit. That is the invitation to believe in Jesus and to believe in His power. The invitation to confess Him as your Lord in that submissive state where we become exalted. To, to repent of our sins and giving over our wickedness to Him. To be buried with Him and united in Him so that we're guarded by His image, by His holiness. Or being sent out because we're not perfect. And then to live a more abundant life here and a life eternal that we can't even understand how good it gets. If anybody needs to respond to that, or if there's anybody who needs prayers, or anybody who wishes to submit to the eldership here, I say, come down as we stand, as we sing.